All right, hello everyone. Uh, this is the cellular service provider talk. Uh, I'm going to kick it off here right on time here at 7. Uh, I'm going to be covering quite a bit of information here. I'm kind of getting you up to speed on this space. It's not very well known. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my background, kind of the big players in the space, and how I got started here in Milwaukee. Uh, I am currently a cybersecurity solution architect for a business solutions. Uh, that is completely unrelated to what I'm talking about today, but I do have a background in cybersecurity. Uh, my practical experience in this space uh, has mainly been at Verizon, where I was a principal telecom engineer, uh, deploying hundreds of cell sites, mostly in Wisconsin, but throughout the Midwest and the world while I work there. Um, I've been really specializing in what I call the real world blockchain um, or crypto enthusiast space. I only kind of spend time on services that I believe, you know, actually have a useful real world purpose um, and have a, a, a path to real utilization um, that, makes, that makes sense to me. So um, I don't spend any time with DeFi or NFTs or a lot of the other um, kind of areas of, of blockchains. Um, I am a cellular and IoT network operator, so I have, uh, I run a small uh, company where I have people kind of host uh, cellular radios um, as well as IoT radios uh, throughout the country, but mostly here in Wisconsin. So uh, I guess a little bit about me as I jump in here. Uh, this talk isn't all about me, but this gives you kind of a, some background of where I come from, kind of my view on the space and why I think it is a practical application um, of a lot of different technologies and really a lot of luck that we have here. What we have here in the United States, um, especially from the FCC, is something very special that nobody else in the world has. Um, and we've got very lucky here. So I'm gonna go through that in some detail here. Uh, so as I mentioned here, um, a lot of practical experience in the traditional telecom industry. Uh, most of that I earned the hard way at Verizon Wireless. Uh, I deployed their cloud platform. I did core data services engineering, which is a fancy way of saying I did a lot of router work on Cisco and Juniper switches and helped turn up cell sites and VPNs, MPLS switches, all that kind of stuff. Um, spent a lot of time there, enjoyed my time there in the telecom industry. Um, but I did think that it could be done a lot better. <clears throat> Uh, in my free time, <laughs> as you could say, uh, I volunteer for uh, 4M. I'm part of Forward 48 here in Milwaukee. Uh, I work a lot with cybersecurity students across Wisconsin, volunteer time to tell them about the industry, how to get them started with their first job, argu arguably their hardest uh, job to get in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, and I also advise uh, several startups like uh, Relay and Galactic Slice uh, here in Milwaukee. Uh, I spend a lot of time, too, as a community evangelist, so I do a lot of interviews, podcast episodes, talking about the traditional telecom industry, talking about how it's different than I think a lot of people kind of visualize it. So some people have some background, maybe they've heard of Helium before um, or have heard of some of these networks, so I try to really break it down into something that's very practical into what exactly, how do these work, how do you put up a cellular radio on a tower, how do you get a tower? Um, how does this process work in the traditional industry and kind of what we're trying to do now? Um, a lot of uh, the popular term is decentralized infrastructure, decentralized networks. Um, there's still a lot of debate in this space what exactly to call this. Um, DY is the most popular term, or decentralized wireless. Um, DPIN, which is decentralized physical um, internet networks, has come out. And then <laughs> DPUW, uh, decentralized proof of useful work. So we don't have a consensus yet just because there's been an explosion of different approaches um, to how do we create um, kind of redundant, um, useful uh, communication services uh, that anyone can be a part of and deploy, but are still resilient, still secure, um, or at least as secure as what we have today. Uh, so, I mean, here's some big numbers basically saying, you know, it's a huge industry, the wireless industry, the telecom industry, the cellular industry. Uh, it provides a lot of jobs. Um, everyone here has a cell phone. Everyone probably wishes they paid less for it. Um, and that's kind of the dream here. Uh, that's the end goal is that we are trying to bring down the costs of wireless service uh, dramatically from what it is today. Um, now, what do, what do I mean by that hard numbers? What I mean is that um, I think that in three, five, or 10 years, um, the, the goal and the success of all these different um, approaches to this problem of getting affordable cellular service, um, sort of affordable home internet service, is that we should have unlimited data, unlimited phone calls, unlimited text messages for a cost of $5 a month. Um, that is possible with this approach. Um, and that provides, I think, a, enough 
profit incentive for everybody in this ecosystem, which is pretty dramatic. And that is something that definitely the Verizons, the AT&Ts of the world do not want to see. Um, they protested quite a bit to the FCC, uh, allowing them to, uh, to even have the possibility of something like this to be created. Um, not a big fan of, of competing. So um, and that's really my frustration. So, um, and one reason why I left the telecom industry is I just thought, you know, how come, it, you know, from the inside we get more equipment that comes in with high, higher capacities, the cost of backhaul service, internet service, continually goes down from the provider point of view. A lot of those cost savings aren't passed on. Um, speeds increase, but costs don't go down. Um, average cost of a cell phone plan, 113 bucks. Most people are somewhere, you know, 50 to 100 bucks um, that I know uh, can be higher. Can be, of course, lower too. Uh, there, there's plenty of low cost networks that are out there and uh, can give you quite a bit uh, lower cost service, but arguably a, a far lower quality as well. Uh, we've seen some approaches here. So we saw Loon come in from Google. Oh, all right, gotcha. Uh, so we saw Loon come in from, uh, with another approach. I said, well, we're gonna put up a lot of uh, atmospheric balloons and that's gonna be our solution to providing low cost cellular service. Now, uh, that's gonna come back here towards the end of the talk because um, a lot of those guys came back, but uh, that approach ultimately failed because carriers did not want anything to do with that and would not work with them. Uh, we have Starlink, which I would argue is uh, probably the, the most successful, most disruptive kind of entry into this ecosystem of providing coverage anywhere at an affordable rate. I wouldn't quite call it affordable today, but you can just pop one up as long as you're in a covered zone and get service. That is hugely disruptive, makes it a much more competitive industry. Uh, so you might be wondering, you know, how are we allowed to do this? Why are, you know, why is this, how is this even possible? Well, it, it's a big thanks to the FCC. It's really due to two main things. And the first thing that came in was CBRS, um, Citizens Band Radio Spectrum. And this was really just given us from, uh, really from the Navy, but basically they said, we're gonna bring up the spectrum and allow anyone who follows the rules to use it. Uh, and the rules are very straightforward. Um, to go ahead and register with the FCC and allow to use the spectrum. And they have, they've broken it up into different bands. They have the general access band and priority access band. But in general, they made it very, very easy to get a hold of cellular spectrum that works on any recent Android phone, any um, iPhone that's iPhone 8 or newer. So it really opened up and said, wow, okay, we fixed uh, the spectrum problem. We have bands that we can use and go ahead and utilize those bands to have cellular service. Um, specifically, it's band 48 um, for CBRS um, in the LTE 4G world and then N48 um, in the 5G world. The last part of that was um, o what's called OTARD installation rules. And this was the FCC saying that your landlord, your HOA, your state, city, local government cannot come in and say you are not allowed to put up broadband. Um, so this has been reaffirmed in several court cases saying that as long as you're following building codes, safety codes that are local to you, um, you can pass an inspection. Um, they can't just say we don't like it and you can't build there. Um, um, cities hated this, HOAs hated it, but um, you're allowed to do this today. And this, the, those really two things brought out some huge barriers to allowing these products to even be possible. Uh, nowhere else in the world do we have such strong protections in place to not only install broadband infrastructure with a fairly loose definition, but nowhere else do we have the ability to actually utilize free spectrum that commodity cell phones can use. So that without that, none of this would be possible. It would still be a dream. Uh, the rest of the world is watching this. Several countries have said they're looking at implementing something like this, um, but none of them are. It's only the United States. So what is CBRS? Um, so this, this, this is fairly recent. It's only started in January of 2020. And the FCC said, we're gonna give you 150 megahertz, and that's, a, in my opinion, a fairly narrow band, but it's useful, um, a 3.5 gigahertz band, and saying, as long as it's cellular, 4G, 5G, 6G, forever, um, we're gonna allow you to get spectrum licenses that in the past would have cost billions to acquire. So this really kind of commoditizes the ability for you to use uh, cellular service. Now, this is well known in like the wireless ISP industry, and ISPs use this. Um, there are ISPs here in Wisconsin, like Ethoplex. Um, that, that uses CBRS service. So it's well known, well, um, you know, kind of, they have a lot of experience in this territory. So, um, you know, it's not anything, you know, that new. What's very new is just the, the deregulation and the allowing anyone who follows rules to utilize it. 
Um, so OTARD, which stands for Over the Air Reception Devices. Um, so if you're a property owner, if you have um, a tenant who has the right to you know, use a balcony, um, they can put up antennas, they can put up radios. Um, again, you can't just put anything up and you can't just you know, put it on with zip ties. It's gotta be um, a safe and professional installation, uh, but you're able to put that up. Um, so those have really allowed you to put this up. A lot of people put them up in their homes. Um, those aren't tremendously useful to building a network, but it's a good start. Uh, and this has really kind of reinforced the ability for these networks to be a thing. Without this strong legal protection, um, I think there'd be a lot, uh, a, a, it'd be a lot difficult for them to grow as fast as they have. So uh, the model today. Uh, so it, it's fairly straightforward. Um, right now, and I, you know, I give a lot of kudos to the different projects that are in the space, making it kind of very, very simple because, you know, working in the telecom industry, there are thousands of tweaks that you can make to have a, a highly efficient network, and they kind of take on all that cost of optimization and building a network. So users, contributors, deployers, uh, so I worked at a very large deployer called Hexagon Wireless, uh, you know, we raised we raised funding to be able to buy this equipment on behalf of investors and deploy it throughout the country, um, including here in Milwaukee, and put this up and get it installed. We work with various projects, and I'm gonna go over some of those projects uh, a little later on here, but those projects basically, they work with these different manufacturers to say, you're the equipment that we wanna use. We're gonna go ahead and the mobile core, we're gonna maintain it for you, and we're gonna make it as simple as possible um, for you to give it power, um, give it backhaul slash internet, and we're also um, going to reward you, and that's where this blockchain component comes in. Now, not all of them are doing that. There are um, some new projects out there that are using a hybrid approach or an all-cash approach to where um, that's, uh, you don't have to just take tokens and go to an exchange and exchange them for US dollars or Ethereum or any other token that you like. Um, uh, so that, that is rapidly uh, moving and evolving as well. But they are basically have the responsibility of running the network uh, together. And that's the, the reason why they call it decentralized, which I kind of argue with, um, is that um, anyone can be a part of it. Anyone can buy these radios. I'm gonna have some links up to some of these projects later on. You can go there right now. You can spend 1500 bucks and buy a radio kit and put it up, um, get it approved to um, submit the registration to the FCC to get it um, online and and uh, transmitting, which usually takes anywhere from one to three days. And you'll start earning these tokens uh, that are coming out in the current projects today. There are other projects that are planned to pay cash in the near future uh, and earning from this. And uh, not to get into too much detail about how they earn, but the quality of the install matters. Uh, mainly how high it is, is a big factor. So if you can get a, access to a 200 foot tower, you're gonna earn much, much more than somebody putting it um, on their roof and going just above the roof line. Um, in a residential area. You'll still earn something, but it won't be the same. And what you earn is what these projects kind of take care of um, and usually do it through, you know, in, in the industry, they call it white papers of how much you earn and these are the criteria and that changes and evolves over time. Um, a lot of them have user working groups where they say, this is what we're planning to implement. Can we get feedback from the community? And we're gonna have some type of community vote um, and how that is that that varies from project to project, but there's just some feedback and a back and forth on what they're doing, so it's not completely new. There's no shock. Now, not not every project has been that friendly. Um, uh, you, if if you saw me last year, I was talking here a lot about Pollen as one of these projects, and um, that they they drastically changed their approach here and said um, we're not we're no longer going to honor what we originally did. We're really worried about this uh, about SEC going after us. We're going to pull out and change everything. Um, a, a rug pull is what most people called it. Um, regardless of that, though, there has been increasingly uh, a lot of money being poured into this space. Um, typically, between 10 and 20 million from VC investors or new projects coming in saying, hey, we're gonna, we have this much in our war chest to deploy these networks. So um, even in the current market, they are growing quite quickly. Um, I can say just on my knowledge, over 20,000 of these radios uh, were purchased last year, and that's probably on the low end. And I think this year it's going to be around 40 to 50,000 CBRS radios. Um, and Buy Cells, which happens to be a, a local company here in Wisconsin, they're headquartered um, over in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, produces uh, the majority of radios used in these projects. They're not the only one, uh, but, but they're the largest by far. And 
um, also commonly used by a lot of wireless ISPs. Um, manufacturers love these projects, absolutely love it. They make a lot of money selling these kits. Um, all in one kits where you have the antenna and the radio all in one unit, very simple to install. And then more advanced higher powered kits where you have separate, uh, you have separate antennas like what you have in the bottom here in the bottom right. Um, to where it, you've got an outdoor enclosure, um, you've got a, a much larger radio and higher, higher powered antennas. So how do you earn today? So obviously these networks are fairly new. I don't think anybody here is using any of them. Um, how do they get paid? So the mechanism that they use is kind of uh, similar to other mechanisms um, in, a, in you know, other parts of, uh, I'll say, the, <laughs> the sea of blockchain. Um, they use something called the proof of coverage. So basically, when you go and submit, you have to register your radio and say, I have pictures to prove I actually installed it here and this way, um, that they then forward on and, and uh, forward on to the FCC in order to get a license grant. Um, through something called the SAS system, the Spectrum Access System. They make it very, very easy to do. They have walkthroughs. Um, so I give them a lot of credit there for drastically simplifying the process of getting a radio up and earning. Um, so while there are users of these networks, it's arguably in the hundreds nationwide, very, very low. Right now it's where you bring your radios up, it's approved to transmit, begins earning based on um, the coverage that they simulate from how it's installed. Um, they're rapidly moving to a model next to where that coverage is validated. And by validating, that means that there's some type of device, typically a dedicated hardware device, and that device um, proves that that radio is not only up and running, but it can actually talk to it. And that's how, that's how the earnings work today. So the goal, which is what they're all working towards, is then obviously you're going to have a lot of users on it, um, thousands of customers um, paying in monthly. So one of these projects, Helium 5G, which is just the, the cellular component of Helium, um, they sold about 200 eSIMs last month. So they do have paying customers. They're paying about a dollar a gig, a very, very high rate. But they're early adopters. Um, they've also found several issues that they're fixing. Um, so it, it's very, very early um, in this movement. But um, there, there's a lot of investment in this space. And obviously, deployers like uh, the team that I worked with that are putting these radios up um, all across the country. Uh, a lot of these, you know, I'll call them deployers, are independent, meaning they may have investors, they purchase radios, and they go to people who own high value locations. So these are typically towers, uh, very high rooftops. Um, you know, here it'd be like the US Bank building. Uh, it's an excellent location to put these radios up if, if it's profitable with how much that you make, um, and work out these agreements. So basically, use simulation tools. So here I'm using um, a free simulation tool anybody can use. Um, this is provided by Ubiquity for mapping the coverage um, that you would get at a, at a tower that's out there. Um, you can pay for tools as well. There's plenty of expensive tools in the industry. Um, the one that I prefer to use the most is called Google SAS or Google Spectrum Access System. Um, they have a very, very good uh, simulations, in, in my opinion, for mapping this out, telling them, this is what I think it will cover, this is what I think it will earn, maybe sandbag that 10% and come up with an agreement. You can pay in cash. Um, revenue shares are, are very common. Uh, so I mentioned here, like there's no shortage of investment here, and this is all very recent from this year. Um, Escape Velocity is probably the most well-known uh, fund in this space. They've raised a $25 million fund and they only fund these types of projects. Um, Andrina, which started out as a traditional ISP, um, they just finished their Series A in February, raising 15 million. And then really wireless, um, so they are um, one of the projects that, uh, that just kind of entered the space. Um, not a lot of information about them yet, but they closed an $18 million seed run. So um, regardless of the market, there's a lot of money going into this space. Um, and one of the reasons why I, I continue to have confidence that in the next three, five, 10 years, um, this is gonna get some significant uh, traction in the market. With that said, uh, there is no shortage of problems that they've had and drama uh, in this space. So here's a Forbes article talking about how um, a lot of insiders um, slash executives at Helium, and by Helium, the, the older, the Laura Wan IoT network, um, made a lot of money, uh, basically didn't disclose their holdings in the network. Uh, and I think that's absolutely true. Um, they, they should have disclosed more of the holdings that they had um, and been more transparent about that. Um, Paul and Mobile, which I mentioned, and Paul and Mobile was a big partner that I worked with uh, last year. 
um, uh, did what you know most would call a rug pull. They said, we're getting out of all the tokens, all the stuff that we issued to you that had market value. We're going to cap that value. Um, we're kind of to destroy the market for those tokens we're giving out. Um, so that angered quite a few, quite a few people. Um, a lot of people lost um, a lot of money, uh, millions in, in several cases, uh, for trusting and believing that they were going to be um, a leader in the space. So there, there's lots of risk here. Uh, I don't want to downplay how this is a, a new emerging market. Um, I've got a chart here, Helium earnings, um, just destroyed. Um, that's their, their main token. They have multiple tokens for different projects, one for IoT, one for, one for 5G called mobile. But I mean, uh, as an asset class, it's, it's, it's just absolutely uh, horrible um, trying to get an ROI out here. Um, and various other issues that we've had here. Um, well, the networks here, XNet, currently has no liquidity, which means even if you earn these tokens, uh, you cannot sell them. No one's going to buy them anywhere uh they have no value so um and that's not um and that is part of their fault there should be more demand for it but um, that's a that's a big problem that no one's trading their token um that the liquidity is so low it can just dry up um yeah so what have i been kind of doing for the past year how did i get these radios up so um, i worked with Texcon wireless as a vp of deployment there and what we did is really focused on areas in the United States that we think that this type of model would have a lot of traction. So um, we bought our antennas from KP Performance. Um, they have great quality antennas, again, used by a lot of ISPs today. Um, WISPA has um, a public database of all the members. So WISPA is the Wireless ISP Association. So most serious wireless ISPs are a member. Um, we also went to um, their national events that they have, including the recent broadband summit they had here in Milwaukee, and went there and went to look for who are the wireless ISPs we could work with, because it's a very, very complimentary relationship working with wireless ISPs. They have good quality locations. They already have customers. They're already profitable. They have rooftops. Um, they also have power and, uh, and a lot of backhaul slash internet. So uh, they're very easy to work with. So. And a shout out here, I do a lot of work with Ethoplex um, here in southeastern Wisconsin. Uh, we've deployed uh, many, many radios throughout the Milwaukee area, and we have plans to deploy a lot more. Um, on top of that, Andrina, who I mentioned earlier, just raised uh, you know, quite a bit of money, have decided that they're going to enter the Milwaukee market and deploy these radios as well. So uh, it, it's still a, a very hot um, kind of area uh, to get into. Now, you can go to FreedomFi and buy these radios yourselves. So here's a kit for $2,500. Um, if you wanted to buy a brand new kit, um, you can find used ones on eBay as well for miners who um, you know, want to cash out or are done with the project. Um, there aren't a lot of them, but you typically see one or two a week um, and go ahead and buy it. Um, there are simulators available at the current market rate um, of these tokens that will give you an ROI. So you can kind of say, okay, if I buy this radio and I pay this and I I generate, you know, I estimate I'm going to generate around this many, this many tokens at this value. Um, this is how quickly I will pay off the equipment and start being profitable. And that's what, um, you know, a lot of hobbyists, enthusiasts do. It's also what a lot of large deployers do. Um, and that's what I did as well. Now, um, I did a lot of work here, um, working at Hexagon Wireless. Uh, we put out thought pieces talking about how it's more efficient, um, how we can have dramatically lower costs. Um, I put up there simulations from Google SaaS of what it looks like. So we have um, four radios on top of the Ambassador um, kind of hotel just down the street here and what that coverage looks like. In general, um, you know, what's that? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> there heard a, heard a question there. But uh, um, that's, you know, quite a bit of coverage for, I, I'd argue, a, a you know, a, a pretty good um, install versus going on like rooftops. Um, so we got a picture there. This is uh, me and uh, Morgan who uh, came in from Rise Broadband and joined the team. And that was our first test site. Uh, that's over on top of the uh, uh, Prince Laugh building in Third Ward. Um, we've got two 430s. Uh, those are buy sells 430s. Uh, pointed off, and <laughs> I think that's the NBC 27 uh, traffic camera up there, and then the U.S. Bank building in the background. Um, so we were there last summer putting that up, um, getting those radios out there, um, and that was our test site. It went very, very well. Yes.
Yeah, so how much you make a mutt, uh, that depends on the project, and you can also flash them back and forth. Uh, so these are the these are smaller all-in-one units. Um, on on a helium today, um, so their method of earning is called um, coverage or coverage points. You'd earn about twenty thousand per radio today. Again, as more come online, that's going to uh, reduce as you're competing with everybody else. Uh, and those have a market rate today of point zero 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 three cents per token. So you're looking at about six bucks per radio today. Um, six months per six dollars today if you sold them immediately um, and then per a month you know then obviously it starts adding up and start calculating what you have for the year but be aware that over time you're going to earn you know um, you know 50 less every day uh, 20,000 would be my estimate for this model deployed today yeah. 20,000 points a day yeah. Yep. Yep. And um, Helium, they've got some ROI calculators you can use. I would also, I would be very um, careful with those calculators. Some of them are very aggressive. I would definitely sandbag those numbers um, and double check what they call the market rate. I would look at the uh, live trading markets to see what those are trading at before I say this. Um, I've seen some pretty crazy estimates um, out there. Um, and I and because we're working with a partner here, Ethoplex, um, you know, it's very, very important that we give them accurate estimates otherwise there's no the partnership falls apart they got they have to plan on how much they're going to make because they have hard costs as well there's cost for their installers to install these radios there's cost of backhaul um, and obviously electricity they aren't major costs but they have to factor that in um, into this uh, plan here so um, and i also did some um, work at events kind of talking with isps across the nation um, about how this works um, i'll say you know pretty frankly today a lot of people are scared of this type of uh, movement slash technology. Um, it's kind of hard to, there's a lot of early believers. Uh, right now, I guess I could put myself in that camp of saying it's, it's definitely possible the technology works. Um, the main thing to pull it off is really just customer adoption um, and getting down to a reasonable cost point, um, which I believe is $5 a month for unlimited everything, unlimited data, limited calls, limited text messages, et cetera, limited home internet. Um, the speeds that these radios can provide are not going to be the same speeds that you're going to get from Verizon, AT&T. So being realistic here, these radios go for, can only transmit at one watt. You're going up against Verizon radios, they're at 40 watts, 80 watts, significantly more powerful, significantly more range. However, you're still going to get 70 megs down and 40 megs up on these radios. That's not bad. Now, when they're fully utilized, if you got uh, these ones max out at about 64 people slash users slash cell phones, um, obviously that's going to go down and be shared between all those users. It will be slower. It will have less range. But, you know, these radios here uh, cover uh, several blocks east all the way down to the waterfront, and then go west through the interchange. Um, and these are, um, uh, you know, not the biggest ones we have. We have some bigger radios than this with dedicated antennas that can go much farther than that. The most range that I've seen from some of our towers closer to, close to, I'd say around 200 feet high, um, those are, those, I think I've seen them go as far as 15 miles. So they offer pretty good range out there in rural areas. <laughs> All right, so where are we at today? So the major players uh, they need to that, that keep an eye on. So Helium 5G is probably the most well one. Um, a lot of people may have heard of Helium or known them through the IoT or LoRaWAN or miners. Um, that's not, um, in my opinion, those are extremely unprofitable and they don't, the, the, um, they have yet to show that there's any type of traction in that space. Um, famously, their network of a million nodes, only 40% of them are online and they're only making like 8,000 a month. Um, I think that'll get better, but that is extremely poor revenue. Um, and performance for a network of that size and the amount of money that was invested. Um, from my prior experience in the telecom industry, working in the cellular industry, uh, I believe that, that Helium 5G is a much better approach that scales a lot better, it's a lot higher capacity. Um, they have been, you know, I think, very blunt in a lot of their recent community calls saying that they want to be an MVNO. So they want to be the boost, the cricket of the space. Um, that's the only way they can go forward. So right now, um, they can't purchase them today. They're in the middle of, uh, of a migration project. But um, they do offer service today. It's $20 for 20 gigs. 
and you also roam on a T-Mobile if you're in an area where the radios uh, don't cover that area. So, um, but they have plans to get drastically bigger. Uh, so right now you're looking at about 8,000 radios, my estimate about 20,000 between all the projects, not just Helium, were sold last year. Um, I know that for this year they're, they're much more aggressive and it's closer to 40 or 50,000 CBRS radios. Uh, makes the manufacturers very, very happy. Um, I don't think that's nearly enough radios to get the coverage that they need. Um, I think it'd be closer to, you know, maybe 120, 150,000 radios, maybe higher. Um, and also it depends a lot on how, how well they're installed as well. But um, the, the, they are the leader in the space. They have more radios than anybody else. Uh, they move more um, units than anybody else, and they're the originals. Helium was really the first experiment that really proved that this could be possible at a large scale. So um, I give them a lot of credit. Uh, for what they did and, and how they grew this network um, and, and really creates where we are at today. We wouldn't be here without them. Uh, with that said, lately, in my opinion, you know, they've had to really um, sit, learn from the other entrants in this area. So um, they've had to learn from their competitors how to keep on innovating. It's just they, they originally came in here with a focus on LoRaWAN, but this focus on 5G um, is continuing to evolve and catch up to where the competitors are at. Um, to be you know, kind of transparent, most of the fleet that I currently manage is, is on Helium 5G or is being flashed to their network just because you can have one pretty much anywhere and start earning, uh, which that flexibility is, is pretty useful. Um, with that said, I, I do not think they're the most profitable network today that I put my radios on. It, it depends where you're at. And that kind of brings me to the next kind of new entrant here called XNet. Um, so xnet.company, um, there's a couple xnets out there, <laughs> gotta make sure you get xnet.company um, in this space. So they have, they have a very different approach um, and strategy. They're not trying to become their own cricket or boost. What they're trying to do is simply say, well, we've identified high value areas of the country that do not have good wireless coverage in our opinion. And we believe that um, through giving the right types of rewards out in these, what they call their clusters, that they sell out that um, their network will be much more valuable. They've announced publicly that this year they plan to sell 10 of these clusters or come to an agreement to where the data is sold from these clusters um, to different carriers. Um, so they recently just opened up Chicago, it's their most recent one. Currently they have no coverage in Wisconsin, so that means if you buy one and you deploy it here um, in Wisconsin today, you're not gonna earn anything. It'd have to come up, you have to move it to Chicago, San Francisco, Houston, Dallas, uh, New York um, is their main focus, but they've been very aggressive. Um, their team has a lot, uh, as opposed to Helium, who are people who had no industry background or experience uh, from the majority of them. Some of them did have uh, some from their, uh, from an acquisition, they did gain some wireless ISP experience, but um, they have a lot of former Googlers, people from uh, different cellular companies around the world. So a lot of industry expertise kind of a different tweak on the formula here. They just want to offload traffic and get paid for that. Um, they have said that they believe they can get $1, you know, a gig is not a crazy amount for them to get for offload traffic from a major carrier. They've been very coy about saying, you know, exactly who these networks will be with besides big name you already know. But um, in the clusters where they are, it's very profitable to put them in. You'll, you're, off, you're often gonna earn, I'd say at least 75% more in terms of revenue from deploying in their coverage areas. Uh, with that said, while you can earn more uh, from what they're offering, they have a very, very small network. Um, they have at any time about 50 radios up and 50 is pretty small. Anyone could put up a network of 50 radios uh, pretty quickly with the right funding. Um, obviously this, this is nowhere near what Helium has at 8,000. Uh, but they're, they're probably, I'd say, the next big player in the space. Um, really is new one that came in. So they're, uh, they're, they're pretty interesting. Um, there's not a lot of details in their project, but I wanted to mention them as kind of the next big player in this space. There's a lot of information we're saying coming soon or join our wait list. Um, their equipment is probably the most, even though it's the same buy sales equipment that the other projects use, they've marked it up higher than the other projects. They do not support flashing into their projects, so you have to buy their equipment, even though it's the exact same radio. Uh, from another project with a different firmware. They spray paint it, um, so it looks cool, uh, but not much past that. Uh, uh, but they are 
you know, they, they have a track record of success in other industries in terms of be doing price comparisons. So on their website, they allow you to stack rank every single cellular service provider um, in the United States. And their idea is that, hey, we're gonna have all these different options that are out there, and we're gonna also put up our own network as well. So, well, they're being very coy about exactly how this would work, and I would argue paying you know, $7 for one gig of data is an extremely insane, insanely high price. Um, it may be, it's good for early adopters, but, um, you know, they, they've got a lot to figure out as well to scale up and get these prices uh, down where they need to be. Um, if I were to guess, and I, I have no inside knowledge here, I think that they're doing a hybrid approach of the last two. Um, they're going to say, well, there's areas that we focus on and we, we sell the service that we have, but also work with external providers. So kind of a, a blend of the other ones. They're not strictly trying to be their own virtual carrier and they're not strictly trying to just sell their coverage. They're doing a blend of the two. So it's another approach. I like that there's more competition in the industry. We'll be successful, um, you know, hopefully. Um, I think there's a chance that all these approaches could work and all of them could also fail as well. Um, but it is good to see someone trying out, you know, a very, I would argue, very consumer focused um, approach to this industry. I would, I would argue the biggest issue we have right now are there are too many enthusiasts who, like me, came from the industry think this is cool that you can put up your own radio and use it at your house or give it to a friend with a QR code and they can jump on your cellular network and it just it just works. It's it's just using technology as designed. Um, getting out of that kind of enthusiast space, getting into mainstream adoption. Um, how many years will that take? Um, my guess would be five to ten, but we'll have to see here. Um, so what if you want to do this today? Um, outside of having $2,500, um, or you, you know, buy it for maybe, let's say, 700 on eBay, buy a used kit that someone, uh, someone is giving up. So uh, I would argue the best locations tend to be 60 feet um, on a tower with power and internet. Um, if you can't get that, you can, of course, put it up in your home. There's no rules against that. Um, you're just gonna, you, in general, you're gonna earn less long-term, so make sure you factor that into your calculations. Probably take like 40 to 60% out of what, of what these calculators have in. Uh, if it's not your house, you need to convince them to let you install the equipment. I would highly, highly recommend that you do a rev share and find someone who's into this and not, you know, doesn't go running away when you say blockchain or crypto, which is hard, um, especially in this environment that we have today. You can pay them cash rent, of course, but um, cash rent, um, you know, has ups, is a nice downside, has a nice predictable agreement. Um, but on the, on the flip side, um, it removes it removes any type of upside for whoever you're paying. So if this does take off, if you pick a project that happens, it does do very well um, and become profitable, they lose that. Um, well, you get all the upside um, if, if they believe it has a future. So um, in general, I recommend find a rev share, find somebody else who's open to this um, and, and going on this journey with you. Um, now, here's some, some pictures that I took, um, just some coverage areas here. So I've got here in the background, we've got XNet. Um, and the reason, so I'll explain kind of at a high level how their model works. Um, and I'll just be transparent, I plan to deploy quite a few radios in these areas. Uh, so they have all this area's covered, it's got kind of a nice haze to it. The gold ones are basically thinking like a 3x earnings multiplier. They said that coverage there from all the carriers that are out there today is so bad that we will pay you three times normal rate to get your radios up there. Um, the silver is about double, and then the general is general, um, kind of two, kind of uh, going to be just our baseline rate. So <laughs> they pay out a little differently in helium. Um, an average radio is going to pay um, 2,000 xnet um, every two weeks, so about 4,000 a month. Um, and those, uh, when they were trading, uh, go for about five cents each. So you earn earn quite a bit more with XNet uh, that's out there. Uh, I've got helium up there, um, similar from the last map I put up, and then um, in the bottom with the red kind of hexagons that are there, uh, that is uh, pollen, which I previously deployed to. All those radios that are up there are all mine. Um, I was literally two days ago flashing a bunch of those radios um, over to helium um, just because we, the, our partner there, Ethoplex, just we earn a lot more with that uh, moving over to the helium network, um, which is nice that we have the ability to do that and kind of save that investment. Um, but it is high risk and it is a, a bit speculative. 
so what is you know kind of the, the goal of what why are we all doing this why am I doing this um, as I mentioned in the beginning um, I believe we can um, it's gonna take time it's gonna take a lot of work but we're gonna drastically bring down the cost of wireless connectivity um, everywhere including rural areas um, I don't want to compete with wireless ISPs um, the wireless ISPs that I work with we enable them to grow to white label what we do where they're interested and give them another additional revenue stream that doesn't compete with what they have today um, I, I think it makes a lot of sense because these, from their point of view, um, if you're buying this radio and putting it up, they're not paying you for the spectrum that you're using. Um, that's freely available. Um, they're not paying you for the bandwidth that's available and they require a certain speed. Um, so from their point of view, I think it's incredibly uh, affordable and efficient and that's why they can bring down the costs. Um, I think the goal is, is $5, $5. Um, it's gonna be, it's gonna take a while to get there. It's gonna take years. Um, and I, this competition, in my opinion, is, is going to end up being good for everyone, whether they're, they're a part of this or not. It will make the space uh, more competitive, at a minimum, on the kind of what they call virtual MVNO or virtual network operator space uh, with the crickets and boosts of the world. I hope that it's going to make the high end more competitive as well with AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens here. We, we're comparing, you know, 40 watt radios gets one watt radio, so it's quite a different comparison in terms of capabilities and speeds. At least today, um, 5G radios have just come out that are compatible with these projects. And those are drastically higher speeds. Um, that's more of a gig, can what, what you can see even with one watt. Uh, we'll see if that pans out, but that's very exciting as well as we go to 5G and of course 6G eventually later on. Um, that's out there and anyone could buy one, anyone can put them up. Um, and earn from them. So uh, what's going to happen in the next year or two? Um, in my opinion, kind of the big changes, and this has already been announced um, by the projects in the space is license spectrum. So they want to get rid of the handcuffs that they kind of have using freely available um, CBRS spectrum. Well, it's great that it's affordable. Um, it can get congested very, very quickly. And um, most of the major carriers have bought what they call priority access. Priority means that they can go ahead and say, well, I'm going to use CBRS as well, but because I paid extra for a priority license, even though it's generally available, I have a higher priority than you and I can knock you out and you can no longer transmit and use that spectrum. Um, so that's a big risk for the space. Uh, it hasn't been an issue uh, yet, but I can see it easily being an issue over the next couple of years. Uh, so I believe that XNet is going to have licensed spectrum, really well licensed spectrum. I don't know about Helium. Uh, they've been very coy about it. Don't really want to address it. Uh, more interested in the space. Um, I think this is a fraction of the projects that we're going to see. Uh, really just joined. Um, I know just from uh, conversations that I've had, there's at least, I'd say, five to seven others that are kind of waiting to go public. They're in stealth um, who want to get into offering this this space. Um, I hope that they're all legitimate. I hope that what happened with Pollen doesn't happen again and they're not just trying to sell a lot of radios um, that they've marked up um, to people and then kind of exit the space. Um, that, that could happen again. It is a very risk. There is, you know, a degree of risk there. Um, but it also kind of reaffirms that this has a real path to success in the industry. Um, and the last thing is large-scale deployers um, like the team I'm, I'm working with um, staking territory. So we've kind of staked the upper Midwest as kind of our home. Chicago, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, that's our background, that's our home base. If you want to deploy that equipment here, we're going to be able to do that very quickly and very easily. Um, you've got Long Fi down in Texas, that they've staked that as their territory. Work with them for any Texas deployments. Res Fi in Florida. Um, um, and then in it's a little crazy when you're talking about San Francisco, San Diego, there's multiple uh, units there. In total, I'd estimate from companies that I know, there's about two dozen um, large companies in here in this space who have uh, bought a sizable number, I'd say 100, 200 or more in this space and are, and are uh, putting significant amount of capital, and by significant I mean millions of dollars into this space. So that gives um, all of us kind of some confidence that this has a future and we're getting closer uh, to this market. Um, but uh, yeah, trying to give an even version, not be too bullish on, on what's going to happen here. Um, so uh, big announcement that I have. So uh, me and a couple buddies are, I haven't, haven't given up. So um, well, the startup that we had didn't get, get, get past our seed round. Uh, me and some friends in Chicago have announced that we're going to be buying an ISP. Um, it's not a, not a small transaction at all. Um, we're currently 
um, very close to having that close. Um, so we, I'll be able to release some more details uh, about the name of what we're working on. Uh, we already have agreements with both Helium and XNet to deploy um, hundreds of their radios uh, within Chicago. So it's a Chicago-based wireless ISP. Um, and uh, we'd like to continue to expand that uh, throughout really the Midwest. So Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, Iowa, Indiana um, are all on our roadmap. Um, so um, luckily we have, uh, there's still plenty of funding in this space and uh, we're able to find investors who have the confidence that we have uh, that this is gonna be successful. Um, I will say that a lot of what wireless ISPs, regardless if they do this other stuff that I'm talking about with Helium, Accident, and the other projects are still profitable. Um, but uh, we believe that there's a, a very high chance that these will accelerate their growth over the next uh, uh, next three to ten years. <clears throat> All right. All right. So uh, with that, I wanted to leave plenty of uh, time here for questions. Um, I've covered quite a bit. I don't. Hopefully, I covered most of your questions that you had, but I'm sure that there's more. Um, this is a, a very new area of both. I would say of blockchain technologies and the telecom industry. Um, in my opinion, it's never been exciting as it is right now. It's been in 30 years uh, to allow people to actually put up real infrastructure that is real demand. Um, with that said, it's still got a long way to go, but I'll uh, hold here, see if anyone's got any questions here. I'm sure there's something I didn't cover. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, you know, it was, it was really a, a lucky conflict with many things. So first, Helium with their IoT LoRaWAN technology, they were able to scale up very quickly. That, that was insanely popular in 2020 and 2021, and then it crashed. Um, that coming around the same time as this deregulation from the FCC was just kind of a perfect influx of an opportunity to evolve in this space. So that, that's why it came to be, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So most of them today um, do eSIMs, but um, I have had uh, tested physical SIMs as well. And I have also tested those physical SIMs in like traditional um, uh, CPE gear that you would use on, on customers. So CPE stands for, you know, customer premise equipment. Um, it's what an ISP, you know, calls a device that can take like a cellular signal and convert it into Wi-Fi and wired internet they would use in your home. Um, so yes, those are available. Right now, it, it's it's reverted back to just eSIMs. Yeah. And, and it, it sucks too because there are there's currently no CP in the market that uses an eSIM. They're still working on it, but it's coming. Oh. Yeah, was that a question or no? <laughs> yeah. Back there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's through our partnership with Ethoplex. So they already have an existing leasing agreement with them uh, to provide uh, wireless ISP service from their rooftop. Uh, so we work with Ethoplex as kind of a sublease tenant with them to be able to put that equipment up um, is how it's structured. Um, in effect, yes, we are paying the hotel. Um, to have the right there. Um, all this is done above board, um, even though there is a blockchain component to it. Uh, we have legal counsel on staff, and we have you know, written and reviewed agreements that uh, lawyers and attorneys have went over, and, and we've both signed. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, if it is a Helium eSIM, you're, you're just going to go to T-Mobile and it'll just keep working like nothing happened. Um, it doesn't, it'll, it'll still say Helium, but on the back end it'll be T-Mobile and it'll be invisible to you. And it'll just work. Um, for the other providers out there, they don't currently do that, so it'll be a hard drop off. Um, it'll just have no service. Yeah. Oh boy, we got a couple here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Yep. I, I do. So um, what I do, so I don't have the, the power to make, you know, really directly outside of being a major influencer because I deploy so many of these radios. Um, so I'm very active on their community calls and in our discussions with them. So most of the people who run these projects, um, I've met in person and talked with them about their plans and their future strategy. And we're, we're pretty well aligned there. Um, the path to getting there is, is still a bit hazy. Um, uh, a lot of the projects when you talk about marketing, let people know, they kind of dump that on you. <laughs> They're not going to take out a Super Bowl ad and say, come join our network yet, and hopefully one day. Um, and they may argue with me about that vision today because today they're charging a dollar a gig and you know for 20 gigs which is really expensive uh, for early adopters um, the only real way to do that today is to jump on um, is become part of their call slave weekly calls on monday um, they're public and recorded and say this is what i think we need to do i've got this group of people here who are going to help us deploy this many radios and i think we need to get the cost down to this and Influential people in the community tend to show up and care and give that type of feedback. Obviously, is is being a major pro, uh, major deployer in the space. Um, they take that in kind, but um, I cannot tell them what to do, um, and that's why I, I kind of hate the term now decentralized because they they do hold the control um, with with all this technology. They have the developers, um, they control the contracts, they control the payouts, um, regardless of the, you know the, the nice the nice vision that we all have. Um, so that, that's really about it. It's really kind of an ask and an alignment and kind of private meetings of, of, of where they see it going one day. Um, but I have no legal recourse if they change their mind. Um, I mean, anybody can sue, but I don't have anything hard, you know, to kind of tell them what to do. When I say I own the network, I own these radios. That's it. I don't control what they do with it. I don't control their pricing. Um, I don't control the community. But um, and different. And at different phases of growth, they're, they're more and less receptive to that type of feedback. Um, so I mentioned Paul and Paul didn't care what you thought. They just changed their mind. I said, fine, doesn't matter what you bought or how much money you spent. We're going to go this way and we don't really care what you think. Um, Helium still takes that, but they're a bit tougher because they're like, we've been doing this a long time or anybody else. And we're like, okay, a whole three years, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, um, but outside of that, um, uh, you know, they, you know, they get a little bit, uh, quite a bit of respect too, because without them, no, this would have been possible too. Um, and then the new kids on the block are very open to feedback and new ideas and getting there. Um, however, they have bosses and investors as well who want to see a healthy ROI. So they don't necessarily want to have cheap service right away. They want to kind of ride the wave and figure out how many people are going to pay for, you know, uh, $20 for 20 gigs. Okay, how many people are going to pay $5 for 20? They're going to kind of ride and figure that out. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a long-winded answer to just say, I don't have a whole lot of say, but I can be a, a squeaky wheel. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it does feel like that. I would argue, I, I would agree with you and say it feels like the early days of dial-up internet when they kind of regulate to where any, anybody has the right to kind of be a, a dial-up provider and made it very, very easy back in the day. Um, it feels like those early days where we're figuring it out, what works, what doesn't work. Um, but the tech is there, the tech is solid, it makes sense, I, I use it at my house every day. Um, in my opinion, it's more reliable than Wi-Fi and it's preferable to Wi-Fi once you get used to it. Um, get used to just using your phone and other devices with it. And you, obviously you have, um, you have uh, physical SIM cards um, as well. Um, yeah, it feels like those early days of you know, we're not quite sure where this is going to go and who the winner is going to be, but we're going to keep trying different approaches until something sticks. And, and, and luckily, investors and VCs agree too. Because <laughs> they, they got to pay everybody to build this. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. Um, and we've had um, here's what I'm seeing right now. And so far, this model is, is hasn't failed us. 
wherever you see a lot of people who are into crypto and you put radios there, that's your best bet. So San Francisco, Houston, Miami, a little bit in Dallas, um, a lot in New York, not a whole, a little bit in Chicago, not a whole lot here in Milwaukee. <laughs> There's some, but it's, it's few and far between. But, um, outside of just being a population graph, you, you got to find those people on the extreme end of the risk curve who want to try something new um, and aren't scared of crypto or NFTs or blockchain or cellular service provided by that. And that's that's been the model so far. Um, yeah, that's where you're going to have, in my opinion, the, the best return on your investment of a radio because it will have the most utilization. The only way any of this is successful long term is if we actually see people paying for real service. Yeah. Yep. That's where the subscribers will be, whether you build your radio there or not. Yeah, is what we're seeing. So your, your radio being there or not has no influence on subscribers is what we've seen. Simply, they are where they're at and you need to go where they're at. But if you put up a radio, they're not gonna come to you. And if you don't put up a radio, they're not gonna move. So um, that's what we've seen. And that's why these regional deployers have kind of a race to these valuable areas and to cover those first. Um, past that, once we get to hopefully tens of thousands of customers, then this will go out into less populated communities. Um, I've had quite a few discussions because I think this, the way this technology works right now is kind of handicapping its growth because we should be working more with wireless ISPs and allow them to have their own customers using these same radios, using the same technology, but also compatible with these networks as well. And why today you have to deploy two separate networks, which is a huge waste, but it's the only way to have it done. Um, uh, I, I think that's the future. Um, there are a lot of discussions about that. Will that happen this year? I doubt it. <laughs> but it, it will come. Yeah. Yes. Longfi? Yeah, very familiar with them. Uh, they're, they're a major deployer, yes. Um, Yep, I know CoffeeZilla. I haven't met him in person, but yeah. Yeah, so the, there's two, and there's two long FIs out there. I should be specific. There's long, there's kind of long FI, the deployer of these types of projects, and long FI kind of a protocol that's out there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So. There, yeah, um, I did a, a very short list here, what I think are the most mature projects. There are dozens of other, um, especially in the, um, uh, that's in the LoRaWAN space. There are dozens of these projects. There's, there's Chirp as a big one. There's Crank um, that are similar. Um, personally, I don't spend any time on any of them because I believe there's no revenue there, um, but they could, yeah, I, I don't know them as well. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, so I look at it at the feasibility of, of this of the cellular radios and the investment required and the markup on that. Um, a lot of those projects are just marking up Raspberry Pis and Beagle boards um, to crazy high prices, uh, usually you know just under a thousand. Um, as far as you know, is this a flip? Is can you trust this project? Is it not a scam? Um, comes up all the time. The only thing that you have on Helium is relationships and trust and people I've been working with for years. Um, Xnet is fairly new, I don't know them as well. Um, I have connections to a lot of Googlers, but that's about it. Um, I would argue the best thing you can do is look up the history of the people leading the project in excruciating detail. Where they worked, who they worked with, what's their history. If you can get an interview with somebody who worked with them, is your best bet to figure out what they're real, if they have long-term intentions or short-term. If you get any hint of 
any improprietary things, um, harassment, um, investment dump, um, left on bad terms, I would run. I, I would have a very high nose for all these projects and, and run if you have a hint of anything you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, sorry, I'm over here, yeah. So I gotta go here. <laughs> but, uh, cool, thank you.